Hi there, I'm Nafis Salatic. This is Across the Balkans, and this week it's a region on fire. At least half a dozen countries have had huge tracts of land destroyed, and along with it, people's homes and livelihoods, as the wildfires burn out of control. This past month has seen fires in North Macedonia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Montenegro, Kosovo and Albania. But the worst affected place has been Greece. There, authorities struggled to contain the blaze, which the Greek Prime Minister said were burning in every corner of the country. The fire on Evia, Greece's second biggest island, was burning for days, forcing thousands of residents to evacuate. Journalist Nicolas Vafiadis is in Athens for us. Uh, Nicolas, thanks for being with us. Uh, Greece started to count the cost. What's the damage by this wildfire catastrophe? It's a big damage. So far, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the extent of the fire all over Greece is almost a quarter of a million acres of uh, burned land uh, and uh, the, the authorities are now counting houses uh, that were burned down, houses that were destroyed, and uh, we are at the process of mapping the damage, a very huge damage that uh, is uh, only seen very rarely, both in Greece and in the broader area. Uh, at one point, the Deputy Minister for Civil Protection, Nikos Hardalias, said, quote, we are waging a battle of the titans. Uh, I mean, how do you think the government responded to the fires? Were they prepared for this? To, to, to tell you the truth, it was indeed a titanic natural phenomenon of uh, the kind that overpowers human capabilities. During the last 10 days only, there have been... 586 fires all over Greece. That's a huge number that represents a 350 rise in comparison with the yearly fires the last 20 years. And the dry period, you have to bear in mind, is not over yet. On the other hand, there was also a titanic effort by the government, the local authorities, and the inhabitants of the affected areas. However, the coordination was less than perfect. And therefore, if it were a battle of titans, it was not a battle of equals or of equal titans, if you like. That is why, in a dramatic televised statement, the Prime Minister openly apologized for any weaknesses during the firefighting effort and promised that lessons will be learned and those who did not perform will be held accountable. Right, and Greece has seen this before in 2018 too, so it seems like the lessons haven't been learned. Uh, but did we see a cooperation among the Balkan countries um, during the fires in Greece and here in Turkey uh, and across the Mediterranean this time? Actually, I believe that during times of crisis, the best of human virtues come to surface. And we had the chance to see the grandeur of solidarity throughout this period. There was actually a tsunami, I would say, of brotherly help, both in human and important firefighting resources to Greece by more than 20 countries. Firefighters with their trucks arrived from Serbia, from Ukraine, from Romania, from Germany, from France, from Austria, from Poland, from the Czech Republic, from Slovakia, from Great Britain, from Qatar, from Kuwait, from Egypt, from Spain. And not only fire trucks and people, but also, most importantly, planes and helicopters from these and other countries like the USA, Russia, Sweden or Switzerland. President Putin sent two gigantic Ilyushin firebombing planes and two helicopters just yesterday. But the most moving offer were the two Canadair firefighting planes that Turkey is sending to Greece immediately after winning its own battle against this menace of the fires. We have a proverb in Greece that says, when your neighbor's house is on fire, run to help because your house is next. And the solidarity of Turkey is also greatly appreciated on a political level, as uh, the foreign minister, Mr. Nikos Dendias, uh, told uh, yesterday, actually, to his counterpart, Mr. Mevlut Cavusoglu. Right, I guess uh, we all here in this region come together in the time of crisis. Nikolas, uh, thanks so much for being with us on Across the Balkans. Nikolas Vafiadis in Athens, uh, there for us. One part of the region not threatened by fire is a lake on the border between Albania and North Macedonia. But Lake Ohrid faces threats of a different kind.
It's been neglected, polluted and overdeveloped and as a result risks losing its prized World Heritage status. But there's still time to save it. UNESCO granted authorities two more years to turn things around before the UN agency will have no other choice but to list it as an endangered site. Becky Mlachi is there to see if UNESCO's final warning is being taken seriously. This is Lake Ohrid, home to hundreds of species not found anywhere else on Earth. The town on the shore is one of Europe's oldest human settlements. It's been a UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1979, but construction and pollution have put the designation on shaky ground. In July, Ohrid narrowly escaped being put on the UN's endangered list. Toy valorizacija i priznanje za implementacijata i založbite na preporakite koji što ги вложи општина Охрид и Република Северна Македонија. But activists say the lake is in a worse state that UNESCO realizes. Тоа што го знаеме и што го видовме се измените на Босна и Херцеговина кои драстично различно различна слика прикажа за регионот од таа што ја утврдија експертите кои беа овде во својата реактивна мониторинг мисија во 2020 година. North Macedonia now has two years to prove it's taking protection seriously. I've come to Ohrid to see how the authorities plan to do that. I'm welcomed by the mayor, Konstantin Georgievski. He tells me that UNESCO is demanding that illegally constructed buildings be demolished quickly. He thinks that will only happen after the end of the tourist season and local elections in October. Треба да изработиме проект за крајбрежје кој што поточно ќе го изработува агенција за просторно планирање кој што ќе дефинира какви објекти ќе може во иднина да се градат на крајбрежјето и да се стопанисуваат плажите затоа што многу е тешко да се направи баланс во еден ваков посет, жив посет голем со граница од преку 400 км во кој што луѓето живеат, значи остваруваат економија, а во од друга страна да се направи и, и заштита на тој истиот истиот посет. Lake Ohrid is one of the most densely biodiverse lakes in the world, but pollution from motorized boats and rubbish thrown by people is taking its toll. Authorities are planning to restrict where boats can go. But one diver is doing what he can to save the living fossils from extinction. Nicola Pascali is a professional diver and also a devoted environmentalist who has been collecting garbage from the bottom of the lake for the past 10 years. He wants to show me how alarming the situation is. He plunges into the water with an empty sack while I wait on the shore. About 20 minutes later, he returns with a bag full of trash. Отпад од муштети на живиот свет во езерото. Пример еден какво вбило отпад да фрлите во езерото за година дена, тој отпаден материјал станува дом на повеќе од десетици видови на организми. Од школки, мали рибчина, алги, колони на бактери и свето тука почнува да живее и ствара свој дом. И ние со, со чистењето им ги уништуваме дон, домовите. Затоа е најпаметно отпад да не се фрла и да користиме биоразградливи материјали, тоа е природни. Не сме цело езеро да се стави, односно цело крајбрежје да се стави во некаква зона да нема пловидба во, во таа зона. Зошто? Затоа што на Охрид покрај она што треба да го заштитиме, потребен му е и одржливиот развој. Ако туристите ги возиме по сред езеро, тие да не можат да видат ништо од природните убави или настрана на повторно ништо не сме направиле, затоа треба една а, огромна а, полемика, една огромна дискусија кои треба да бидат тие зони кои што на некој начин треба да бидат изолирани од пловидба, односно да бидат адекватно обележени и таму да не пристапуваат пловни објекти. One of UNESCO's biggest environmental concerns is this wetland known as the Studentishta marsh. I met Dragana Velkovska, a member of the NGO Ohrid SOS that was the first to raise the alarm against the planned construction of commercial buildings here. She tells me that this is Lake Ohrid's only surviving wetland 
and it's meant to act as a purification filter for the water and as a place for carp to breed. Instead, it's drying up since a new road cut it off from the rest of the lake. Видејќи блатото функционира како природен филтер, тоа е прибежиште за различни видови организми, за различна флора и фауна кои живеат овде на овој предел, има извонредно големо значење за обстанокот на самото езеро, тоа го потврдија и експертите од Сдруженијето за блатни екосистеми, кои беа овде, тие се светски експерти, усвоја една декларација за заштита на екосистемот и на Охридското езеро и на студенчешкото блато, препорачаа негова Рамсар дезигнација, односно номинирање како Рамсарско подраче, што за среќа после толку долги години борба успеавме да го да го обезбедиме. The mayor of Ohrid for his part promises the construction of canals. Значи ке треба да да изработиме ние канали дренажни кои што ке ке ја поврзат, ке го поврза студенчешкото блато со езерото и ке има комуникација за нормално функционирање на екосистемот на на блатото. Being a UNESCO World Heritage Site brings responsibilities but privileges as well. They are usually considered must visit places. That's certainly the case with Lake Ohrid that depends very much on foreigners who come here for cultural tourism. So losing this privilege can be disastrous. Не треба да постои никаква дискусија околу заштита на градот по Донецко. Ние како град и нормално туристичкиот сектор мора да свати дека Унеско е големо обележе, односно бренд за градот. Значи ние како град од Донецко добиваме многу. Странските гости доаѓаат за нашите културно историски споменици. Имаме на пример ево број од гости во Република Македонија се турските гости. Тие доаѓаат во најголем број. Тие доаѓаат за осман османските остатоци кои ги имаме доста во во Охрид. Значи имаме многу од тој период. Имаме византиска историја, имаме античка историја. А Охрид мора да го зачува статусот на УНЕСКО. На туристите да им се прати јасна порака дека Охрид не регионот не е место за масовен туризам. Ова е место за одржлив туризам. Таков туризам ние веќе гледаме дека е во зачетоците на развивањето. Има а, една иницијатива која веќе почна, се вика Genuine Experiences. Тоа е платформа која што нуди одржлив развој, односно туристички искуства со локалните жители. А, такво нешто е тоа што му треба на регионот. Не бесконечно градење на бетонски зданија кои ја уништуваат животната средина. North Macedonia will have to submit an updated report to the World Heritage Center by February 2023. If the authorities fail to convince UNESCO of their progress, this region could find itself on the same list as nature reserves in Central Africa and all cities in the war zone Syria, Yemen and Libya. The list of heritage sites in danger. Bekim Lachi, Ohrid. North Macedonia. That was a story about North Macedonia and Albania. Just add Serbia into the mix and you've got yourself the latest controversial free trade zone. The three nations have agreed to abolish border controls starting next year. It's a plan for regional cooperation, modeled off the EU's customs free zone. It was even called the mini Schengen until it was rebranded to Open Balkan Initiative. But the idea has not been well received by its other Balkan neighbors. Abdulveha Bayupi tells us why. Appearing united in front of the media, the leaders of Serbia, Albania and North Macedonia want to send a clear message to the EU that the Western Balkans is no longer a battlefield, but a region of peace and cooperation. At last month's economic forum in Skopje, the idea of mini Schengen area in the Balkans took a step closer to becoming a reality. A project that started almost two years ago may have changed its name, but not its purpose, to create a single market to strengthen trade and ties. The political economic cooperation between Serbia, Albania and North Macedonia will now be called Open Balkans. As the name implies, the table is open to other Western Balkan countries to join, namely 
Kosovo, Montenegro and Bosnia and Herzegovina, but they have concerns about the initiative. The project emulates the European Union's visa-free Schengen zone and aims to follow in the EU's footsteps to implement fundamental economic freedoms. Edi Rama, Aleksandr Vucic and Zoran Zaev signed several deals to intensify cooperation. They include zero minutes at the border from January 2023 for all importers and exporters, mutual recognition of work permits and qualifications, and an agreement to cooperate on national disaster relief. Kadeka Balkanot počnuva da sozdava najvisoko nivo na razbiranje, deka ekonomsko to povarzuvanje i sozdavanje to na dinamičen i vitalen regionalen ekonomski prostor e zajednička želba i ambicija. Serbian president Aleksandar Vučić says the Open Balkan initiative will help overcome disputes between nations and genuinely enhance the region's path to EU membership. I kada smo razgovarali, razmišljali smo o tome kako bi bilo dobro da i oni koji nisu najbliži, a Srbija i Albanija nikada u svojoj istoriji nisu bili naročito bliski i svi međusobno smo imali različite vrste problema, rešili smo da od pogleda u prošlost glavu okrenemo ka budućnosti i razmišljamo o onome što moramo da ostavimo onima koji dolaze, onome što moramo da ostavimo našoj deci. Prime Minister Edirama said Albania couldn't wait for the consensus of all countries in the region, which was seen as a criticism of Kosovo, which is against this initiative. Ky rajon nuk mund vazhdoj të mbedet peng i të shkuarës në asë një aspekt, dhe kush nuk e kupton akoma se sa të vejgjë li jemi të ndarë, për të rritur ekonomit tona, për të kryuar më shumë pun, për të hapur më shumë perspektiv me vënde punet mirë paguara, si do mos për të rrind, është i dënuar të jetoj në të shkura. Despite the enthusiasm from the three participating leaders, there is huge skepticism from other countries in the region, especially Kosovo. Ne si Republike Kosovës konsiderojmë që problemi kryesor në Balkonin përëndimor është mos balafashimi i kreu të Serbis me të kaluarën, përkatsisht me të kaluarën kriminalit të Serbis e cila i shkaktoj katër luftra në dekadën e fundit të shekullit një zetë. Pra tregu i përbashkët duhet pa tjetër të shëqërohet me balafashimin me të kaluarën, me demokratizimin e vendeve tona dhe me sundimin e ligjit. Prime Minister Albin Kurti says, as long as Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic refuses to face the past, he will leave the Balkans vulnerable to Eastern powers. The European Commission supports efforts to integrate all six Western Balkan countries into a common regional market, as a step towards standardizing the EU's rule across Europe. That's despite the fact that the political appetite for EU enlargement is low in the bloc. And come September, a key supporter of Balkan integration, Angela Merkel, will be stepping down. Belgrade will host the next meeting of the Open Balkans project in November. It's hoped by then some of the skeptics may have accepted the open invitation. Abdul Wehab UP, TRT World. Redi Shehu is a political analyst and he'll help us unpack the Open Balkan initiative. He's in Tirana for us. Uh, Redi, thanks for being with us here on Across the Balkans. Now, this is sort of a mini EU in the Balkans uh, in making, but who benefits from this the most? Yes, generally, I'm thinking uh, the most who will benefit, uh, I mean, uh, those countries that have more ethnical population than others. 
in general and in principle, all the countries will benefit. All the WB6 countries will benefit in this initiative. Even EU itself will benefit if it wants to enlarge itself in the future, because we will have a safe zone with this initiative. They will have a zone where the uh, political stability and uh, safety and security and the economic growth will be present after this initiative. So instead of, uh, let's say, the danger of uh, balkanization or European, European Union, they will have or they want to Europeanize the Balkans. So for that reason, in general, all the countries will benefit in the WB6 initiative, but most of them will benefit countries that has larger uh, ethnic groups, in, uh, which means that Albania and Serbia, they have large ethnic groups, and with the politics of no borders that this initiative will apply, uh, it will come that the, uh, the interrelationship between these ethnic groups will be greater. Uh, we will have more compact communication because the four freedoms of Europe applied in this initiative will permit uh, these uh, uh, great ethnic groups to have more and closer economic and the know-how and services and people and capitals exchange. Right. Are, are you talking here about the Albanians who live in four countries? Uh, they live in Kosovo, North Macedonia, Montenegro. Um, can this lead to a stronger relations between them? Of course, of course, absolutely. Uh, it applies the same for Serbia because also Serbia is in four uh, regions in northern, I mean, the Republic of Srpska. They are present in Montenegro and in some enclaves on, of Kosovo. But uh, the more benefit Albanians, because as the same Albanians are, are spread in uh, four countries in Montenegro, Kosovo, and northern Macedonia. But actually, Serbia has more interrelationship with uh, Serbians all over, and Albanians actually do not have such a uh, I mean, compact uh, uh, interrelationship. Uh, with the initi this initiative, Albanians will uh, absolutely uh, benefit more because they will have more compact ethnic uh, uh, area. They have uh, more economic uh, freedom uh, between them. They right. will have also products and political uh, uh, power. Not only that, because, uh, I mean, uh, ethnic groups tend to have relation with, with each other. Right. So instead of going to have with other ethnicities, they first want to have a collaboration with each other. That's why these two big groups will benefit more Albanian and Serbians. Right. Compared the, uh, to Serbians, Albanians will, will have more advantages because they will have more and more uh, economic growth and pol policy power. And the Serbian president, Aleksandar Vucic, called the initiative a historical one. Uh, let's have a listen what he had to say. It is an important initiative that sends a message to our people in North Macedonia, Albania and Serbia that we can act in favour of our nations and that we are in a position to move on the path to the EU. This shows that we are not waiting for someone to let us in and that we want to change our destiny and work in the interest of our countries. Uh, are there fears that Serbia could have more influence in the region through this initiative? Many analysts and media uh, are saying like this, that uh, the most benefiting will be Serbia because they have the largest economy and they are, will be stronger and stronger. Uh, but I think that actually Serbia is uh, exporting to Kosovo 70% of its goods and the same applies in other uh, countries of the region. So economically, Serbia has uh, stabilized itself. I think that, um, to, uh, of course, uh, Serbia will be, I mean, more uh, powerful in politics and economy, of course. But as I said before, Albanians will become more powerful. Why? Because they will, uh, they actually are not so powerful. They are not so correlated with each other. With the new initiative, they will create a safe zone between them and will be the, a kind of equilibrium uh, towards Serbia. They will try to create, I mean, uh, this, uh, the same power in economy and policy as Serbia has already. So for that reason, okay, there is a fear that Serbia will be powerful, but I think that uh, the Albanians will try to maintain the equilibrium in the region.
Right. Now, the most critical towards uh, this initiative was the Kosovo's Prime Minister, Albin Kurti. He says he sees the idea of connecting the markets um, as a trap for certain political gains. And he says the initiative opens the region uh, for more of the Russian and Chinese influence. Uh, what do you make of his response to this? Well, I mean, uh, Mr. Kurti... Um is in somehow uh, encapsulated in his uh, uh, electoral speech. Of course, uh, uh, he, during the campaign, he tried to uh, offer a nationalistic arguments, and of course, he, he won the election with these. So in, in, he's, I mean, encapsulated in this articulation, is not going out for for a certain time. But I think that the contrary is uh, is true. Uh, actually, uh, Russia has influence in Serbia, has influence in Republic of Serbia, Republic has influence in Montenegro, has had also influence in northern Macedonia. Also, Chinese uh, products are everywhere. I mean, these initiatives exactly are uh, conceived uh, uh, to uh, prevent these influence in the region. We don't do not forget that after these initiatives, the biggest supporter of these are United States. We uh, last year we had Mr. Uh, Hoti and Mr. Vucic at the White House in the, in the presence of President Trump, signing the commitment to the Mini Schengen, which means that the United States are very interested that this initiative will be uh, more and more uh, effective in the region, exactly because uh, a compact zone, uh, I mean a region uh, uh, that are uh, so tight together. Uh, they prevent any other, um, I mean, uh, force and power to uh, come like Russia and China. So I think it's quite contrary. I think that Mr. Kuti had to um, re-evaluate the situation because I think that it's in okay. the favor of all Albanians. Okay, Redi, thanks so much for that insight for us. We have to leave it there for time. Redi Shehu, they're a political analyst thanks. in Tirana for us. Okay, Support. thanks for watching this episode of Across the Balkans. We'll leave you with the pictures of some of the region's most beautiful UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye for now.